Thank you so much for your welcome. It's been such a pleasure to be here and to talk to different people about some of these issues and to talk about bilingualism and um, a very uh, common but not well-known disorder, which is developmental language disorder, um, two out of every 30 children present with DLD. So it's something that we're trying to work on raising awareness of. So today I'm going to be talking about this idea of the bilingual delay. Have any of you heard of the bilingual delay? Yes? So there is this assumption or this belief that children by nature of having exposure to two languages are going to be um, delayed in both of their languages. So we've been trying to explore with some of the data that we have whether this is actually true or not. So we know that half of the world is bilingual. In some places where I am in the US, about a third of our population is bilingual, although that is um, growing, so I think soon we'll be to a half, if not more. Um, about a tenth of um, the population of children has a developmental language disorder or dyslexia or some kind of language-based impairment. Um, I did a quick search in um, the NIH database, National Institutes of Health database, for papers on developmental language disorder or specific language impairment, which is what we used to call it, or language impairment, and there are 29,200 published works, which seems like a lot, but on autism, which is less prevalent, there's something like 50,000 papers. Now, if you intersect that with bilingualism, there's 749 papers. So that represents about 2% of the published work in the National Institutes of Health database. So it's no wonder that there are a lot of myths and a lot of assumptions and a lot of misunderstandings about bilingualism, and it's a problem because half the world is bilingual. So we need to be um, increasing our knowledge base around this area. So we know that this is um, many, um, there are many, many languages spoken around the world and through um, immigration and migration, we have linguistic contact between two languages. And I think we've moved from um, an idea that bilingualism is an outlier to bilingualism is really um, the norm and has benefits, right? Um, I think that there are um, a lot of advantages to being bilingual. You certainly can talk to more people. There's some people who've proposed that there's evolutionary advantages um, to being bilingual. It seems to be good for you. It seems to be good for your brain. But what about children who present with developmental disabilities? So what I want to talk to you about today is what is the nature of the bilingual delay? Um, are children, are bilingual children with DLD doubly delayed, right? Do they pose an added risk of impairment? And then how do we consider compare the first and second language performance in order to make accurate diagnostic decisions? So what is the nature of the bilingual delay and where does this come from? And I was in a lecture about two years ago where the opening line to the talk was, it is commonly accepted that bilingual children demonstrate a delay in both their languages. And I was like, well, you've got to be kidding. And they produced you know, a whole page worth of citations that definitely show this idea of the bilingual delay. And so I, we went back to the lab and tried to talk through, well, what's going on? Um, why do we think this? Is it really a delay or is there something else going on? And so that's kind of where this idea came from of exploring the bilingual delay and where it might come from. Um, so it comes from a literature that shows that bilinguals have performed consistently low on a bunch of different measures. For example, on measures of IQ, bilinguals will score lower than their monolingual peers. On measures um, of academic performance, bilinguals often score lower than their monolingual peers. And also on language measures, 
um, bilinguals um, score lower than their bilingual than their monolingual peers. So I started looking at some of the literature from about 100 years ago. And I think this, this is really important literature because it kind of sets the tone for assumptions that really affect what we're thinking about today in terms of what is bilingualism and wh whether there are benefits or aren't benefits, especially for kids who may have developmental disabilities. So Epstein says in 1905, um, bilingualism is a social plague. Um, and um, here's another one, Yoshi Yoshioka, who says, bilingualism is a hardship devoid of apparent advantage. This is 100 years ago. And certainly, I mean, part of this is in a US context where there was a big push for um, assimilation. And I think that's really important to know as well. But I don't think that this is an unusual perspective that, by, that the norm or that the the standard should be monolingualism. Um, here's another quote where they said that code switching is a linguistic um, confusion. And then one of my favorite quotes to hate is this one by Goodenough, and Goodenough is one of the you know, parents of psychology, um, who says, this might be considered evidence that the use of a foreign language in the home is one of the chief factors in producing mental retardation as measure, measured by intelligence tests. So I think these are critical questions that permeate how we think about bilingualism now and how we think about bilingualism in the context of a disability especially. So what do we know about bilingualism? We know that it's highly varied. We know that children learn their first and their second language at different points in their life. So we have children who um, have exposure to two or more languages from birth. We have children who start learning their second language when they start preschool or when they start kindergarten. And then we have children who might have their first um, contact with another language um, through immigration when they may be adolescents or high school or young adults, right? Um, we also know that there's different proportions of current input and output in each of children's languages. So through a regular day, they may hear their home language at home, they may hear the school language at school, they may interact with neighbors and family and friends in one or two or three different languages. And so the configuration of bilingualism is going to vary a lot in children. And then what they learn in each language may be different. So they may encode vocabulary, knowledge that they need to be able to you know, meet um, um, cultural and um, academic demands at home versus school. And that may mean that they're going to learn different vocabulary, different forms of language. They learn to interact in different ways. So they also may not know everything in one language than they know in another. So what is the um, evidence for the bilingual delay? So here is um, one paper that we worked on where we um, looked at 600 children with and without language impairment. The lines across the top are typical children. Our lines at the bottom, the, the solid lines in each pair of lines are children with um, DLD. And you can see that um, in the middle at the 50-50 mark in each of those squares, those children are performing lower than the highest point. So those 50-50 marks are children who have 50-50 exposure, more or less, to Spanish and English. And um, the high points are the kids who have 100% exposure to Spanish or 100% exposure to English. And I think the top ones are I can't read that. The top ones are English and the bottom two squares are Spanish. So you can see that as kids have more English exposure, they score higher in English. As they have more Spanish exposure, they score higher in Spanish. This is the same set of kids for all four graphs. But in the middle, they're always lower than their more monolingual counterparts. And so I think part of the bilingual delay assumption comes from these kinds of findings.
Um, this is um, from a paper by Erica Hoff. And again, the children with the most English exposure in this case have the highest scores across the board. And the children with the least English exposure have the lowest scores across the board. And, um, and so you can see this effect of, bilingual, of bilingualism at the bottom graph. I think these are um, Spanish exposed children. And again, children with more divided exposure tend to be lower in their test performance compared to children with higher exposure to one language or the other. Um, this is another paper that, um, that I worked on. And again, you can see that in the center, these are our kids at that 40 to 60 percent exposure. And their scores here in the middle are lower than either the English um, scores for kids with 100 percent exposure and lower than kids who have um, Spanish at 100 percent exposure. So you can see that the same um, that, that children um, com compared in Spanish and English in this case show what could be interpreted as a delay um, in both of their languages when we um, look at the data this way. I have a couple more to show you because the evidence is overwhelming. And these are just a few of the papers um, that, um, that are out there on school age children focused on Spanish English bilingualism in the US. So this is another paper. And you can see here that um, I've highlighted kindergarten and first grade children on a vocabulary test and on a sentence repetition task. And you can see that um, they're scoring lower than the norm in, again, in both their languages. So the norm would be a mean of 100, and they're at 75, 81, 84, 86 in each of their two languages. Um, and then for the sentence repetition task, the mean is the normative mean for monolingual, or the normative mean is um, 10, and they're scoring, again, about two-thirds of a standard deviation below the mean. Okay, again, in both languages. So this is often taken to be evidence of the bilingual delay. Now, we did a paper um, where we looked at about 1,000 Spanish-English bilingual preschool kids. And we, again, look at, looked at them at these different levels of exposure. So the bar on the far right are our children with the most Spanish exposure. The bar on the left is are the children with the most English exposure. The one in the center are 50-50 exposure to Spanish and English. And then in the other, the other two bars are these kids that are in the middle. So they might have 70% um, exposure to English and 30% exposure to Spanish or the other way around. So it's looking at them along that continuum that we we group them into these larger, larger groups by exposure level. Um, and what you see here is um, the bottom part of the green bars or the darker green bars indicate the number of children who fell in the risk range for developmental language disability. And we find no statistical difference in the number of children that fall in the risk category. So why is that? Why is it that we have kids who are scoring low in both languages, and those kids in the middle score lower in both languages, but the incidence of risk is the same as every other group. And so that's kind of what started us thinking about that, uh, what we needed to do um, here with this, um, with this data. So we went back to all the different data that we had. So over these different studies, we have data on about 4,000 children. And um, we said, you know, maybe this, well, you know, I do psychometrics in my spare time. And so when, you know, like if you, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I said, well, maybe this is a, a measurement problem, right? Maybe we're not measuring the right thing in the right way. And I think the other thing that might be going on is that we're masking 
individual variation by looking at children in groups. So we tend to do these statistical analyses and we do them at the group level. But what happens when we look at kids one by one and look at their performance as their, um, 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 as look at their performance in each of their two languages and compare their performance at the individual level. So we wanted to kind of do that and so we looked at this question again of what is the nature of the bilingual delay considering individual variation. So in this first study we looked at 1300 or so typically developing kids with um, um, who had complete data. So these are children who had um, data in terms of their exposure levels in each of their two languages, in Spanish and English. These were all preschool age children. Um, we excluded children who might have language impairment, who scored in the um, lowest seventh percentile um, on these measures. And um, we also excluded about 180 kids with missing data. So the ones that we included had four tests, one in Span two in Spanish, two in English, in morphosyntax, and in semantics. Um, and they had all their exposure data from their parents and from their teachers. Um, the test that we gave them is the bilingual English-Spanish screener, oral Spanish screener, which is besos, <laughs> which is kisses. Um, and then I, ha I have a name for the infant toddler one, but we just don't have an infant toddler test, but we couldn't help but make a name for it. And we're testing, like I said before, um, Spanish um, English morphosyntax, Spanish English semantics. Um, we also developed the survey where we're asking parents hour by hour what language the child has exposure to, who they're with during that period of time, what language the child is speaking to that person to get a really good picture of what, um, of, of what the child's typical day is like, what their typical weekend is like. And this is just one example of, of an item. We asked them things like, look at these two pictures. What's different about them? And so they had to describe those differences. These are preschool kids. Um, this is another um, example of a picture where we said, tell me, show me everything that you use to clean with. And so they had to go through the picture and identify the cleaning tools. Um, this is another um, item, this is a morphosyntactic item, and we asked children to complete the sentence. And here, um, translated to English, it says Juan is going to paint the table. What's he doing here? He is painting the table, but we're looking for um, the use of that um, la um, clitic form. Um, and then here's another example, and here is um, one in English. This is the girl's umbrella, and here this is the clown's umbrella. And so we're looking for that possessive marker. Okay, and so the, this is how we tested children's morphosyntactic production and their semantic knowledge. We also did the input-output survey, and here what we do is we ask them, this is an example of how we ask families hour by hour, who are you with, what are you doing, what language does that person use, what language does the child use. And this is an interview that takes about 10 minutes to give, and then we have another interview that we ask them about whether they have concerns um, about their language. So we group children in three groups. Um, English dominant, and these are kids who had 60% or more exposure to English. Um, balanced bilinguals, these are children who have between 60 and 40% expo um, percent exposure to English and Spanish. And then Spanish dominant, these are children who have 60% or more exposure um, to Spanish. And this is what we get, right, on these two tests. So it's the same result that everybody else is getting. The English dominant kids are doing better in English. That's not a surprise. The Spanish speaking kids are doing better in Spanish. Also not a surprise. The balanced bilingual kids are doing a little bit better in Spanish than in English, but they're low in both as a group. Um, if you want to draw it continuously. This is what that looks like. It's a very nice line. There's a linear association there. It's, it's, it's almost boring, right? 
But if let's look at the kids on an individual level. And so what I did here is I just grabbed the children. This is about 1,300 kids, so I grabbed um, the 15 or so kids who were at the extreme level of English, so English 100% of the time. I grabbed about 15 kids at Spanish 100% of the time, and then I grabbed 15 kids in the middle. And so I just grabbed you know, the first 15 I could grab in the spreadsheet, and I looked at their Spanish and English scores, and these are standard scores, so the mean um, for the normative mean is 100, a standard deviation is 15. So what do we have? So if you look at English across the board, their English is always better. Well, that makes perfect sense. If you look at Spanish, their Spanish is always better. But what about the kids in the middle? If we look at the kids in the middle, they're everywhere. So on an individual basis, about half of these kids who have 50-50% exposure to Spanish and English, sometimes they're doing better in Spanish, sometimes they're doing better in English, and I think this is what's going on statistically, is when we throw them all together, we're lowering the mean because we're putting in their scores in their better language for some kids and in their worse language for other kids. And so I think that this is what is going on here. And so then we, make the same graph as before, and these are the averages for the kids. Another very boring graph, <laughs> right? Um, no interactions and a boring line, right? Straight across the board. So across the board, um, if we look at kids on a child-by-child -child basis in their better language, we have no variation in their scores. So do bilinguals actually show a delay, a bilingual delay in both languages? Come on. No, it's a, it's a myth, right? We're going to bust that myth. <laughs> um, but I think this tells us about, you know, how it is we should be looking, and I think that looking at group statistics is very powerful, but we also have to think about the individual variability that kids bring um, to this table. And bilingualism is interesting because it is variable. Um, psychometrically, it's a nightmare, but um, there's a lot of interesting things that are going on, and I think looking at these kids at, um, at the individual level is really important. So bilinguals actually are within normal limits in one language, and so I think the bilingual delay is a myth. I don't know if we can put it to rest now, but um, I'm trying. All right. So we shouldn't assume that a delay in both languages then is not developmental language disorder. So my next question is, are bilinguals with DLD double delayed? So if we know that bilingual, typical bilinguals don't show bilingual delay, what about children with DLD? Do they show the, pattern, the same patterns as our typical kids or do they show a different pattern? So in this um, data set, we pulled from three different studies, 600 children with, um, um, who were bilingual between the ages of, I don't know, they're school age kids. I wanna say four to nine, but I, I yeah, they're four to nine years old, okay? And we had 100 of them who were identified with DLD. And they were identified with DLD on the basis of parent report, narrative samples, narrative testing, um, as well as expert review. So we didn't use, we, didn't, we wanted to avoid circularity, so we didn't use the measures that I'm going to show you the results of here to identify the children. Um, so they were tested using the BESA or the BESAME. The BESA is our um, four to six year old test and the BESAME is the extension of that test and that means kiss me. Um, we just started down that road. My lab is called the ABLA lab. It's the Human Abilities in Bilingual, Bilingual Language Acquisition Lab and it means talk. Um, so I can't help myself. Um, so we tested them in morphosyntax, again, morphosyntax, Spanish or English, um, semant um, and English, um, semantic Spanish and English, and we 
in our lab protocols, we try to test every child in both of their languages. So if they are Spanish, English, bilinguals, we test them in both languages and we abandon testing if they can't do the test in that language. But we always try. We never say, okay, they're dominant in English, we're only gonna test them in English, or they're dominant in Spanish, we are only gonna test them in Spanish, because we want to understand what the limits of their bilingualism is. Um, we're, we're starting a new study in for Vietnamese English bilinguals and we're doing the same kind of thing because we don't know how well, well, we have an idea that exposure predicts um, what language children are dominant in, but there's so much individual variation that we don't want to miss information that we might otherwise have. Um, and then we did the parent interview that I described before, which is this one. We also look at age of um, acquisition um, as well. So these kids had age of acquisition, about half of them before two years old, and the other half at about preschool age. So again, a lot of variability in when they first had um, their first English exposure, and um, again, a lot of variability in terms of their current exposure to Spanish versus English from zero to 100%. Um, these are the means for the kids. So again, it looks like across the board, kids are doing a little lower than the mean. So our typical kids are below the mean in everything except for Spanish semantics. Um, and they're still a little bit below. They're about, what, half a standard, uh, a third of a standard deviation below the mean. Um, but you can see there's a lot of variability. Our kids with um, developmental language disorder are even more, are even lower, which is what you would expect. Um, but they're also probably lower, um, well, they're lower than the typical kids, okay? So let's look at, um, at this group of kids. So these are our, um, Again, like before, we're looking at our English monolinguals or our kids at the end of English exposure, so the 100% English exposed kids in each of their languages, the Spanish exposed kids, and the kids right in the middle of the 50-50 kids. And so what do we have here? So um, again, our kids with English and um, with English exposure, whether they have typical development or DLD, are doing better in English. Our Spanish-speaking kids who have more exposure to Spanish are doing better um, in Spanish. And our kids in the middle, again, are all over the place. So our DLD kids are showing, are just demonstrating the same kind of pattern in both of their languages as the typical kids. So what do we see here um, in terms of our uh, patterns of performance? So this shows the pattern of performance for our um, for morphosyntax in Spanish. Um, so you can see that um, there's an effect of exposure probably a little bit more for the typical kids than the kids with DLD. The, Kids with DLD are flat, they're lower, and, um, um, but there is an association with exposure. Um, for English, um, that's the blue line, there's a, an effect of exposure with their performance in English for both children with and without DLD. And then I'm overlaying the pink line, let me take away the rest of it. And so we see again this kind of flat um, line across the board for both the typical kids and the kids with DLD. And there isn't really, an, there is no effect here. There's, it looks like there could be, but there's no significant effect for um, exposure for either DLD or typical kids in this analysis. Um, for semantics, we see the same kind of thing. So this is um, English. This is Spanish, sorry. And um, you see an effect of exposure on their Spanish um, performance. You see an effect of exposure on their English um, performance. But then when we look at their better language, we only pulled the better score, right? 
And so here, again, in semantics, we don't see an effect for exposure anymore. And the, um, the lines are flat. The typical kids are right at 100. The kids with impairment, they're right around 80, about a mean score of, a, of around 82. So they're lower than their um, typical peers, which is what you would expect, but they're not as low as how they looked initially in that first slide where I was showing you the means that were more like 60. Okay, they're really in the 80s and not in the 60s. And here's what um, morphosyntax and semantics look like together. So again, there isn't really an effect for exposure. There is an effect for DLD. And I think this, again, gets us to this question, are bilinguals, in fact, are bilinguals with DLD double delayed? Again, no, they're not. We're gonna bust this myth too. So there isn't an added risk for, um, of bilingualism for children with developmental um, language disabilities. So they perform very much in terms of patterns as their monolingual peers with DLD. So their delay isn't any greater, and actually they can do this in two languages. And so that may be an advantage for kids with DLD. Um, they don't have added risk related to exposure. They score similarly to their DLD peers in their better language. Um, and so I think that the implications are uh, that we need to be thinking about how we can better encourage families to maintain their home languages, how can we support the home language, and I think we need to stop telling families to stop using the home language when their child has a developmental disorder. There's no evidence, at least in this first pass at the data, that um, kids with um, developmental language disabilities have an added risk of having exposure to um, two or more languages. So that's it for me. I just want to thank my collaborators. This is definitely not a one um, person show. I have a lot of collaborators. Actually, Yulia is the one who came and said, you know, I don't understand this. She's a cognitive psychologist and she said from the brain perspective it makes no sense that you would have a, de a delay in um, a bilingual delay it makes no sense at all why do you guys do that and I said well we have some data let's look at the data so we started looking at the data and so this became like a group project that we did in the lab and um, this are these are some pictures of the students and collaborators in my lab and I also want to thank the National Institutes of Health because they fund all this research and here's my contact information if you ever want to Follow me on Twitter. If, I don't know how much longer I'll stay on Twitter, but you know. Um, but if you want to follow me on Twitter for now, or um, just email me, I'm always happy to to hear from people. So thank you. And I guess we have a little time for questions. Okay. This is a better picture. Yes. Thank you very much for a. <clears throat> very inspiring and uh, thought-provoking uh, talk. Is this working? Yeah. Yes, good. Yes. Hi, thank you for an interesting lecture. Um, I don't know whether you have that uh, that, um, that number in your head, but what is the, in the data you just showed us, what is the underlying correlation between English proficiency and Spanish proficiency? The the correlation is between Spanish and English proficiency. Yeah. Um, we're, do you mean between their performance in terms of how they did on the tests, or yes, do you mean yes. um, relationships with exposure? No, no, forget about exposure. Just, okay, just. okay. Um, I'm not sure, but that's a really good question. I have to say, I, I don't know offhand. It is um, usually a moderate correlation, so kids who do well tend to do well um, in both of their languages, but um, I can't remember what the correlation is. Yeah. And, yeah, and I guess you also, with regards to exposure, it's basically relative exposure, yeah. but not absolute, which I guess matters, could, well, I don't, we don't know, but could matter as well. 
Yeah, we usually do relative exposure, so we look at um, hour by hour exposure. We also look at age of acquisition, but in our studies, especially with younger children, age of acquisition doesn't account for that much of the variance. Um, usually current exposure um, accounts for all of the variance that there is, and if you, you have to force age of acquisition into the model in order for it to matter. So we have just stuck to um, a, um, current exposure. So, because I think absolute exposure would be kind of the interaction between current and age of, age of acquisition, right? Just the number of hours a day you speak a given language, for example. Oh, oh, hours speaking. Well, I mean, it would be, it, it's not that different from current from percentage of exposure. You're talking about hours of exposure, right? Yeah, um, you know, we did we that question comes up every once in a while, and we've gone back to our data and we've looked at number of hours because we have hours. So we've looked at number of hours and percentage of exposure, and the correlations are exactly the same, even though. At some level, it doesn't make sense, but it does, right? There's only so many hours in the day. Kids are only awake so many hours in their day. And so the correlations end up being almost exactly the same thing. Yeah, but I guess there's, there's huge variation in how many hours parents spend with their children, for example. Right, right. And that we know that correlates with socioeconomic status mm -hmm. probably also. Mm -hmm. There's genetic factors in there that is really hard to tease yes. out. So, so I think there's a lot of that are things yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah. We haven't broken it out that um, at that much. Um, one of my um, former students, Nahar Albadur, has been looking at um, the types of activities going on hour by hour. Right. So, are they reading? Are they playing video games? Are they watching television? Are they talking to peers or parents? And peers, ma what matters a lot are peers. Yeah. Um, for um, how well children are doing in each of their two languages, more than interaction with parents. And, um, and things like reading and electronic games seem to be fairly neutral. Mm. Yeah, so we, we have that same kind of question. So yeah, we, we're starting to explore that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for a very interesting talk, uh, particularly interesting to me as a member of a three-person family in which um, four languages are actively floating around. There you go. Um, I was wondering about you know, further, if you like, um, complexities uh, also on mechanisms. Yes, so we know that uh, the 50-50 kids, uh, many have one and, and the other have the other dominant language. Mm -hmm. What do we know about the drivers uh, of that particular dominant la uh, language? Is it the language of the mother? Is it... Uh, the cultural yeah, environment, really, is it the yeah, class, language, and mm -hmm, so on? Mm -hmm. And that seems to me psychologically very important to try and also yeah. address things uh, mm -hmm. majorly. And then probably statistically more importantly, so if it's true that 50% of the population is bilingual, why stop there? Because, you know, surely uh, a big chunk of that will be trilingual. Oh, yeah, and no, actually. And are we assuming that the mechanisms are the same then for these third, fourth, fifth languages? Neurologically speaking, yeah, for no, example. That, those are super interesting. You know, actually, I think 13% of the world is multilingual. So two-thirds of the world, 63% of the world is bilingual or multilingual. Mm. And, um, I mean, we have the same brain. We have to organize things um, in some way, and we're um, sensitive to the input frequencies that we hear. But you're right. I mean, it is, it is really interesting in the U.S. context, English overwhelms everything. So these kids, even at the lowest level of performance, are kids who are 100% Spanish exposed, do better in English than our 100% exposed English speakers do in Spanish. Does that make sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think that you have to pay attention, like if you're in an environment where English is all around you, and it's like it's an ocean of English in your system, then you're paying attention to it in a way that 
um, when you're monolingual, when you have 100% exposure or 99% exposure to English and a tiny bit of exposure to any other language, you can ignore it and it becomes noise. And so I think that um, there's that social component where kids are paying attention to what's important in that environment and they differentiate between whether or not they should be paying attention to this input or whether they can safely ignore it. And in the US context, I think they can safely, if, they're, if you're monolingual, you can safely ignore every other language. But if you're not, you have to pay attention to your language and English and probably other languages as well. So, so, so it is interesting. It's definitely more than exposure. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Orit Lazarovic. I'm uh, an Israeli speech and language therapist from Israel, who is based in Denmark <laughs> for the past okay. five years. Uh, I'm really glad that I was invited by uh, Cecilia uh, to be here. And I just want to thank you very much for saying these things. It's so, so important. Um, I come from Israel, and most children are bilingual, if not uh, oh, multilingual. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much uh, education, I mm -hmm. think, for parents or for uh, teachers and educational uh, staff members about uh, exposure to uh, other languages and uh, maintaining mm -hmm. uh, the home language mm -hmm. or languages, <laughs> yeah. most likely. But uh, since moving here, I feel that there is so much lack of um, information mm. about this topic in Denmark. Mm -hmm. I've been myself, being a speech therapist, yeah, and talking with my own uh, general uh, doctor about my daughter who is exposed to four languages. And he's been um, very keen on telling me that uh, it's a big mistake and it's okay to maintain two languages, but from the third language, it's gonna be way more complicated. She will have a language delay and so far and so on. Mm -hmm. And this is a very uh, good, in my opinion, <laughs> doctor, but I'm just saying, and so far and so on, I've been working for five years also in an international school here in Odense. Mm -hmm. And the stories I've heard from uh, parents about the children who were born and raised here and getting advices from, you know, pedagogue teachers about uh, just dropping the home uh, language because uh, it might cause a delay, a language yeah. delay. But it doesn't. And it, no, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't matter at some point of how much I can, I, mm -hmm. you know, I try myself to tell mm -hmm. parents it doesn't, there's a clear data about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when they get some bad advice, they just, um, you know, stuck in a way. Yeah. And yeah. it's such a shame. So thank you for being here in Denmark. <laughs> well, thank <laughs> you. So and thank you for your comments. I mean, I think that, you know, when we make these kinds of recommendations, Let's think about the, the, the outcomes, right? The logical outcomes of these. So we ask a family to only speak the language of the country. So what does that do to their home interaction? And what does that do for the child's ability to talk with extended family members? It limits it, right? Or we ask them to only speak the home language and not learn the language of the country if they have a developmental delay. I've heard those kinds of recommendations too. Well, then they aren't going to be able to participate in community and in schooling and those kinds of things. So they pragmatically, they need all of their languages in order to interact. And, and there's this idea that's, yes, maybe bilingualism is hard, but maybe it's a desirable difficulty, right? Things that are hard actually are good for you. <laughs> Right. Yeah. If we did everything the easy way, we probably wouldn't even be in this room, right? So um, things that are hard are good for you. They help us develop. You were going to make a comment. comment. Yeah. Um, I'm a speech pathologist, and I reside here in Denmark. And I, I mean, physicians generally don't know much about language impairment. So we also have physicians telling kids who are monolingual, their parents, that there are kids who, who obviously have DLD, well, it will resolve by itself. So, so I think this is perhaps a general lack of knowledge in our physicians and other professionals about language impairment. And of course, if you are bilingual or multilingual and have DLD, then it's even worse. So yeah, just a comment. 
Yeah, we're, we're, we're working on trying to develop like a short intervention with um, physicians and residents who are doing like their pediatric rotation to do just a one hour like um, uh, workshop on bilingualism and seeing if there's any kind of at least short term effect. Because I think we need to do this training really, really early um, instead of later. And, and, but I do think that the roots of this idea that it's bad for you come from some of these quotes, you know, where people said it's bad, it's bad for you, it's going to be confusing. And it's not confusing, it's hard. But hard might be good for us. Yes. Hi, I very much appreciated your uh, lecture. And as my colleague, I also have a multi, multi, multi language family. But I'm also a scientist, so I was wondering, uh, to eliminate all this bias, as you say, if you're Spanish and you live in the uh, U.S., clearly you're exposed to English language, no matter mm -hmm. what. But there is also something else. I mean, it's the correlation with their uh, meta -meta pattern recognition. Like, has there never been done a, a test, maybe it's already been done, on the correlation between being multilingual and their ability of pattern, re pattern recognition. I mean, them, their mathematical skills, mm. their analytic skills. That's really because interesting Because their one question, is objective. Yeah. It doesn't depend on which language is used, mm -hmm. or it might actually depend on whether or not if you're multilingual, you're perhaps more analytic in nature than a person that has only. Yeah, you're paying only. attention to like the input frequencies. Right, but, but, yeah. exactly. but this one, this, this analysis will be objective in the mm -hmm. sense that eliminates all the underlying biases mm -hmm. on the but it will definitely show whether or not there is a correlation with being multilingual. Yeah, I, um, Mary Alt has done some work looking at um, bilingualism and mathematical knowledge. And it is, um, you know, you can take away a lot of the linguistic bias um, for certain kinds of questions, but then some mathematical questions are steeped in language. And so second oh, language learners do much worse on those, but do very well with the oh, That's why I said yeah. not mathematics, but mat metamathematics, basically pattern recognition, yeah. which does yeah. not depend on the language you have, mm -hmm. but actually on the ability or your analytic skills. Yeah. So it's very delicate. Of course, mm -hmm. if you ask a question to solve a problem with English with or language. Spanish, clearly <laughs> yeah. does. But if you ask to recognize a pattern, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. in both languages, then yeah. that is actually eliminates basically all the biases you yeah. have. Yeah, no, th those are ways of eliminating bias. We did a study looking at um, like nonverbal IQ tests, and some you do need to mediate through language, and then there's others that are more on the like, um, uh, it's like when you have to match a pattern, which is kind of that pattern recognition. Bilingual. Our bilingual kids did just as well as anybody else. Okay. Yeah. But it was a small study, I, you know, it's a hundred kids, so these things bear replication. Thank you, my name is Catalin and I come from um, teacher training college and I would have a question about, um, because as you told, uh, bilingual children in Denmark also, as in other countries, have a lot of difficulties and challenges in their studies, in the school, in uh, a lot of areas and what advice would you give teachers to look after signs when they see that some bilingual children uh, struggle a lot mm -hmm. uh, what signs should they look after uh, when to to send them to to an assessment for DLD what yeah. are the typical differences between bilingual children having uh, challenges because of their bilingualism mm -hmm. and because of DLD yeah, no, that's a really great question because one of the things that we know is that um, the manifestation of DLD is having difficulty learning um, the grammar, usually the grammar of a language. And the things that are hard in the grammar for kids with DLD to learn are also the things that are hard for people learning that language as a second language to learn, right? So it could be, um, it could look similar. So. Um, what I try to look for is not just not just that 
those errors occur, but that they're persistent. So kids with DLD have a hard time learning those new patterns, and typical kids are a little bit more variable because you can see that they're trying to learn those patterns, and so sometimes they make errors, but they don't make an error on that form mm -hmm. all of the time. They're not persistent in doing that. So I think that that would be one thing to look at. I think the other thing is just kind of general learnability. Can they, are they learning language? Are they learning language in a way that's typical or that seems to be consistent with other second language learners? Or are they really unusual and they stand out and they're having very severe difficulties and they aren't able to like make those gains? Um, I think once, you know, it depends on, of course, the home language and how similar it is and all of those things, but I think we see these general patterns that kids who are typical learners, who are learning a second language, they have their, they find a way to communicate and they find a way to, um, um, to make it work, even if they don't know all the vocabulary or they don't know that grammatical form. So one error that we see that's super common in English speak, English learners is um, the, the not um, form, so he does not. So a lot of our kids who are second language learners say he no has. Right, he know has whatever, and but they're marking the negative, and kids with DLD don't know how to even do that, right? And so there you, um, there you start to make those distinctions. So those are the, I think the kinds of things, and then I guess the other thing is productivity. Um, kids who have DLD are not as linguistically productive. It's hard to distinguish from shyness, though, right? I just have a quick, yeah, just a quick comment. Yeah. Also look at their behavioral issues because kids with DLD might be having, they might have problems with concentrating, being focused on the task because of their language problems. So as a teacher, if you see a child, observe a child who is having difficulties with listening or follow up on instructions and so on, could this be an undetected language impairment? So, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Thanks. There yeah. was a question back. Thank you for a really interesting talk. That was very enlightening. Um, I was wondering, all of, all of the studies you presented were on English and versus Spanish. And right. of course, those, uh, they are very different, but they are not that different. Right. Do you have any studies of, say, um, English Chinese, which would be your context, or for in Dan uh, Danish context, Danish Arabic would be, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, be, be really relevant to know? Yeah, no, th those are really good questions. And um, one of the things that we're starting is we're starting a new study looking at Vietnamese English bilinguals because Exactly, there are some structures that are very, very different um, for Vietnamese or for Spanish. So Spanish is highly inflected. Um, um, the manifestation of DLD is different in Spanish compared to English, but then English and Spanish share a lot of root words too. So that may help kids break into that linguistic system. Vietnamese is different grammatically from both Spanish and English. And so we're starting to look at Vietnamese, English bilinguals. Um, um, Vietnamese is um, the Garden, Garden Grove, which is an area in Southern California, has the biggest Vietnamese population outside of Vietnam. So we're hoping that we can get into this community to better understand the linguistic systems. One of the things that happens, though, is that some of these families in the US are in more isolation, and so they lose that, that first language really rapidly compared to our Spanish speakers who you know, um, in the U.S., the U.S. went to Mexico, right? So Spanish speakers were already there. Um, and they have been for generations. So a, a lot of those populations have maintained their language, whereas immigrants who come to the U.S. may be, be more likely to lose those languages. So we're trying to look for communities where they, where we can see more of that language maintenance. And I think we'll see similar patterns in some ways. We're already starting to see some similar patterns of 
of performance on some of the grammatical markers for Vietnamese speaking children learning English as a second language. Um, but we also see some things that are different. So it's a little bit of both. Some things are similar, some things are different. For example, final sounds um, don't occur in Vietnamese. And so final um, grammatical markers in English occur in the final sounds. And so they're dropping those grammatical markers because they are not producing the final sound. So we have to find a way of trying to distinguish between what's a typical um, second language kind of production versus what's impairment. So yeah, we're, we definitely are trying to expand um, to other languages. We also wanted to look at Arabic because Arabic is also interesting and different. So we figured if we could do a tonal language, you know, and like Ar and then Arabic, um, which is from a different language family, and Spanish, we would cover like 90% of the language families of the world. And the H said, NIH said, you've got to be crazy. Start with. Just, oh, and, and we were including Mandarin too. And they said, that's too many languages. You don't have the expertise. And I said, okay, well, we'll do you know, Spanish and Vietnamese. So we're getting there slowly. And I have, I'm lucky to have, um, I have two students right now, who's, one who speaks Mandarin, one who speaks Cantonese. And so we're starting to expand with small end studies, like 20 kids at a time, to see what those patterns are. But um, having large populations of Spanish has helped us see like these broader patterns um, with larger ends, which I think has also been um, good for us so that we can try to expand the, or extend this to other language pairs that are not as common. There was another question. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, a big challenge for us is that, uh, and I know it's a big topic, but a lot of, or all of our tests are in Danish and they're standi standardized, standard, what is that called? Standardized, standardized in, in, in Danish. So we can only like see their Danish uh, level. Yeah. And, and let's say we have a child which the mom is Romanian and the dad is Italian and they speak English together and I tried to like, and what is the, what level do you think you are at it? it becomes very difficult to know is it is that kid in the in the middle part right. or yeah yeah the, that is that is a huge challenge one of the things that we're working on and it, this is what we're working on with this Vietnamese and Spanish project is we're trying to see whether it's po we have some preliminary evidence with um, with this 600 kid group of kids where we looked at their English and we went back and looked at their English performance item by item and we said what do typical kids do in English and what do kids with impairment do in English and where are their large differences as a way of starting to think about using English as the indicator of say DLD right and so those items where kids, typical kids might, sc make, might make some errors, but they're scoring at 80% correct. But kids with DLD are scoring at 30% correct. That says, ah, here's a different, here's, an, here's a, a marker that shows differences. And so we're trying to build on those markers. And so now we're trying to expand that to a larger data set of 1,000 where we're looking at Vietnamese and Spanish speakers at these different le levels of exposure so that we can make better predictions of what children should be able to do given 30% exposure to English or 80% exposure to English. And I think that might be a way that's more personalized where we have this database of items and then we pull that from those items and, and a kid comes in and they have 40% exposure to English or say Danish and you say, okay, for 40% exposed kids, this is what I expect them to be able to do. And you test them only on those things and you say, yes, this child is fine. Or no, this child has something going on. That's kind of what we're moving to after, now that we have this large database of, and that's the other reason we've been trying to test kids in both languages so that we build this database so that we know. Um, 
But I think that's the way to go. And I think that with you know um, computational models, we can um, personalize these measures better. We don't have to do paper pencil tests anymore, right? It can all be computerized, and the computer can pull the items that we need for these different levels of exposure. So that's our current project. We have like 100 kids that we've tested, so we've got 900 to go. Um, and we got the grant in 2020, so <laughs> we, we're a couple years behind. Um, but we're, we're getting there, we're getting there. And we think that this might be a, a, a solution, because we have the same kind of issue. You know, we, I've been lucky that I study Spanish-English bilingualism. I am a Spanish speaker, my parents are immigrants to the US, so I have the same profile that a lot of, a lot of these kids have. Um, where I learned Spanish first at home, and then I started learning English when I was five. Um, but, um, and we have a large Spanish-English um, population in California, and in Texas, and in New York, and Florida. But there are, in Los Angeles, which is an hour away from me, there are about 300 different languages represented, and we don't have enough people who speak all those languages. So, and then in my field of speech pathology, 97% are monolingual English speakers. So there's a very small, um, I, it's, it's expanded, but I used to know like all the bilingual SLPs in my, in my field, <laughs> you know, and we get together at our association meeting, there's like 50 of us or something. So, so it's a very small group of us and we can't do all the work, right? And so we have to find ways of doing it in the second language. And so I think that's, that has been one solution that we're trying to pursue. Um, Nahar Al-Badur, who's one of my former students who's at Ohio State, is trying to use like um, automatic speech recognition to do some of that kind of testing so that, and the idea is we can program, um, you know, intelligent agents to, um, who can recognize different languages and who could do that. And, that testing could be done in a more automated way. And she's starting to have some success with that. So that's the next generation. I'll be retired by the time that works. <laughs> Good. I'm afraid we have to finish, but uh, I want to say thanks again to Thank Liz you. for a wonderful talk and to all of you for all your questions and, and comments. So a final round of applause for, for Liz, maybe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.